praise him, church. Come on, lift up your hands. Let's give him glory. Come on, church. For those of you that have already been healed, you know Jesus. what it takes. Yes. Yes, you know what it takes. Yes. Many of you have come out of your drug and alcohol addiction. Yes. You've come out of all the sickness and disease yes. that have been afflicted upon you. And you know what it takes. But I want you to know for those that have come that need to be healed, you're going to be healed today. Yes. But it takes your expectation. Yes. It takes your anticipation yes. that you yes. absolutely positively believe. That there's no doubt in your mind. You know what faith is? Faith is not that you have to drum up enough belief. It's just hold on to the belief that you have. Just hold on and don't let the enemy try to distort it. You hold your eyes, get your eyes fixed on what Christ has said. And therefore, he's going to say to you today, Child of mine, go your faith because you held your eyes of confidence upon me has healed you. You are going to be set free today. Amen. 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 So give the Lord a shout of praise. Stay standing for just a minute, shake it out. If you need to use the restroom, do it now. If you need a drink, get it now. Amen. Give me just a minute to turn things on. thank you and praise you in advance, Father God, because we know that, Lord God, that we are but your vessels that you pour your word through. So, Father, I know that you have already conditioned the heart of my wife. Father, you've given her all the input that is necessary for us to receive, that it's going to break the yoke and the bondages that is upon us. Every sickness, every disease has to flee at the very presence and hearing of your word. So, Father, I'm speaking on behalf of the audience that is here. Whatever they came in with, Father God, it has just been a lie that the enemy has thrown at them. They don't have to walk in anything less than absolute uprightness and success according to your will. You have come to give us life and life most abundantly, Father God. So, Father, you sent your word to heal our diseases. Heal our frustrations. Heal the impoverishedness of our spirit and our soul. Father, I'm asking right now, Lord God, that you open up the heartstrings of every person here. That they will have faith, believing, confidence, and trust in you. But as that word goes out, Father God, it is not by might nor by power of my wife, but it is by your Holy Spirit. That you are going to intercede and you are going to destroy the antics of the devil right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And then he went to all of you. <laughs> okay, you know what? When we get busy, my sister-in-law can attest to this. When she gets busy in the kitchen, the first thing she does probably, pull her sleeves up, pull her hair back, and she gets busy. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get busy. We're going to get, we're going to get understanding. I want you to receive something so profound today that you are changed when you walk out the door. Amen. That you are shaken by the power of oh, Almighty yeah. God, that something has transpired in the spiritual realm, and that doesn't require me, it requires you. It requires you to be seeking what God has instilled, what God has used, is using 
this voice, it requires you to seek that. You know what that is? It's a mission. It's a plan. Coincidentally, this is Missions Month, and tomorrow is Valentine's Day. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been contemplating Missions Month, Valentine's Day. And specifically, what I landed on was Mission Possible. <laughs> specifically, what I landed on was God's mission and God's love. Because that's really all that matters, is God's mission and God's love. Because we are all part of God's mission. I want you to know some details about missions. How many missionaries do we have in the house today? Yeah. Amen. One, two, three, four, Six, five, eight, nine, ten, eight, nine, ten, ten. <laughs> forty. What a sad testimony. We have five missionaries in the house today. What is a missionary? By the gospel. What is a missionary? Only the gospel the gospel to. I'm sorry? Someone that goes out and spreads the gospel and spreads the love and compassion and whatever is needed at the time to help someone. Do you want to know what the definition, of, the definition? of a missionary is? One who is eager about doing a job or something or a cause. A person who is sent to a foreign country to do religious work. These are the definitions of, this is learner's definition. A religious work such, work, such as convincing people to join a religion, or to help people who are sick and poor. Missionaries seek to impart teaching, the teachings of their church, to people who may not have been exposed to the message. They seek to help these people make better moral decisions, or find spiritual peace. Missionaries also endeavor to do good in the community. Beginning around 1540, an order of Catholic priests and this gives you some of the detail of where we get the understanding of missions. Some of the Catholic priests that were known as Jesuits began to send members to many parts of the world to convert people who believed in other gods to Christianity. Wherever they went, the Catholic missionaries, they built central buildings for their religious work. The buildings themselves became known as missions. I know this is just background information, but I will make a point, I promise. In the 17th century, missions in the American West and Southwest are now preserved as museums. Their foes, the Protestants, soon began sending out their own missions. Today, Protestant mi missionaries are far more numerous than the Jesuit missionaries. Interesting? Meh. <laughs> the definition of missions? Let me ask a missionary. Is that pretty much the definition of mission? You go to a third world country, and you tell people about your church, and you give them stuff. Why is it, and, and let me give you some, some history on this, do you realize that missionaries, the labor and statistics define that missionaries make about $16 an hour. Did you know that? I was stunned when I started doing a little bit of research on this. And did you know that 40% of the world is still unreached? Unreached with the gospel. Almost half of our planet is unreached Amen. with the gospel. From 1540, how many years is that? Quick, mathematician, hundreds. <laughs> hundreds of years, people have been going out, giving the gospel, and half of the planet still hasn't heard anything. Doesn't that stun you? Do you realize that one of every 200,000 Christians is a missionary? One out of every 200,000 Christians. Why isn't anybody signing up? Why are they, why is it, and you guys are all thinking, she's going to ask us to go somewhere. She's going to ask us to give more money. She's going to ask us to get on a plane, go to some horrible, hot climate. And today, it felt like we were in Africa or hell. It was so hot up here. She's going to ask us to do that, right? That's what's going to happen next. She's going to ask us to sign up for a mission. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to question you, why is it that missions fails? Why is mission, the mission, failing? Hundreds and hundreds of years, one out of every 2,000, 200,000, has the impetus to go. One out of every 200,000, and they say 400,000 if you count my missions. So, 
Why is it? What's wrong? What's wrong with the mission? Today I want to talk about, we have these passages that tell us about missions. I'm going to read them off real fast for you. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The context of this particular passage was Jesus to his disciples. They were with him all of this time, and then he said this to them, just as he was, after he was resurrected, he said this to him. He said, go. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations. So, the context of this is very important. You can go, but if you're going and you don't have what they had, you're just going. You're just going, and it's of no value if you go and you don't have what they have. Okay, listen to this next one. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other, other, the other ends of the earth. Jesus appeared to his disciples after the crucifixion and told them this. So they have to go to the other, other ends of the earth. To the other ends of the earth. But he didn't just tell them, just go, just go. He said, go to the upper room. He said, go and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you so that you won't just be going, not just go. We have a lot of just going, but we don't have what we need when we get there, right? Acts chapter 13, 47. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This was the Apostle Paul stating that the gospel had now been opened to the Gentiles. He said this, this is what the Lord had commanded. And then in Mark chapter 16, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Mark tells us in that gospel that after Jesus rose from the dead, he spoke to his disciples. That's what he said to them. But the rest of what he said was pretty important too, wouldn't you say? So when we go... We get our bags, we get our clothing, we raise our money so we can have $16 an hour when we go, and we go. But if we go and we have nothing, when we get there, it's of no value. Stay home. How many missionaries are there in the room? Five? Okay. By the time I get done, there better be some more. <laughs> I want to talk about the biggest, most famous missionary. The one above all. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Pull that up for yes. me. Verse, verse, there you go. In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. Keep going. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us. Mission, love. Mission, love. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might have life through Him. Now you just pulled the scriptures up, and that's okay because you put them, pulled them up in the way I gave you the order. My thought pattern this week was the big mission, not the little mission, not the Africa mission, which, by the way, our sister Nancy spent many, many years, and she'll share some of that next week, I'm sure, because it's who she is. She spent many years in Africa ministering to the people there. God's mission. What was God's mission? In the beginning, he tells us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bring up Genesis chapter 2, or chapter 1, verse 2. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Keep going. Then God said, let there be light. We just read that we are the light. And there was light. Keep going. And God saw the light and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And we go all the way on. We don't have to follow the scripture for scripture because we all know what he did. right? We all know that God created us in his image. And what is his image? 1 John 4.8. 1 John 4.8 tells us what his image is. And we know this. God is love. So God created us in his image and filled the world. And he said, fill the world, multiply, fill it up. What did he want? What was the mission? 
that his love would fill the earth, that his love would overwhelm the, the planet. God is love. There it is. He who does not, that's not the one. God is love. He who does not know love, not love, does not know God, for God is love. It's not, it's not saying to us, God has love. It's not saying to us, here, I'll give you some. Here, give this over there in Africa. It says, God is love. Now, I want to look at a couple of missionaries today that will enlighten us with their mission. God's mission, we see that. We fell. God's mission was redemption. God's mission has always been redemption. God created us in his image, in his image, in his likeness, which is love. He wanted to fill the planet up with love, with his image, with all of us being a member of that image, that part of God. We fell, and what happened? The image, our image, changed. We became amnesia. We had amnesia. We no longer knew who he was. We no longer knew our father, right? That's what happened. We died. Spiritually, we died. We were dead men walking. We fell. We fall. We no longer understood who our father was. We no longer had an identity. We didn't. We were lost. So, John 3.16 says what? For God so loved, back to his love again, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. When I read that, and I'm, I'm looking at this as the big picture. God, your intent from the beginning was to fill the world with you, was to fill the world with representation of you, with love, with your love, and not the mushy kind of candy flower stuff for tomorrow. But don't forget mine. Not that, that's not what he was doing. He was intending to fill the world, every square inch of it. So who are missionaries? We are. We were missionaries. That was our calling. We were Christ in us, the hope yes. of glory. That's who we are. Yes. That's who we were. Now this yes. person that wrote this, that's what we're going to look at today. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to the book of John. We're going to stay there a lot. Do you know there are seminars, there are uh, many, many books and programs and organizations that will teach you how to do missions. They will teach you how to do that. I've had people say to me, I can't do that. I'm not called. I'm not called to be a mission, a missionary. Listen to that. I'm not called to do that. I'm not, I can't do that. I can't speak. I don't know what to say. I, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna raise money so they can go. Yes. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna raise money so they can go so I don't have to. I hate to burst your bubble. You're not getting away with anything. You're not getting away with anything. You're a missionary. And I'm going to show it to you. If you're alive, do this. You have been given life, and you are supposed to exude life. That's mission. That's God's plan. And God's plan, you know, I was thinking this last week, and you heard about a couple of the situations that um, Sister Sandy talked about with a 13-year-old committing suicide. And another gentleman from Koppel who was so depressed he couldn't live anymore. And I'm not going to stay here because it'll tear my heart out. But what I will say is this. Why couldn't he know the mission? Why couldn't he know what Jeremiah 29, 11 says? Why couldn't he know that? For I know the plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. Pull that up. For I know the plans I have for you, God. What is a plan? What's a plan? Basic term. What's a plan? Anybody. Raise your hand if you know it. It's a mission. It's a plan. God says, I have a mission. I have a plan. He's the great missionary. He's the only missionary because God, his creation, these people, those people, those people, that's God's mission. God's mission to the world. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Why couldn't that 13-year-old know that? Why couldn't the other gentleman in Koppel know 
God has a plan for you. Amen. What, why, what was wrong there that they couldn't know that? What was so desperate that, I, I'll tell you why, because we have five missionaries. That's what's wrong. We have five missionaries. John, the writer of this book, let's talk about him for a minute, okay? John is called the Beloved. Can you imagine being told, there's Tommy, the Beloved of God. There's, there's, there's Tommy, the one Jesus loves. There's Pastor Tracy, the one Jesus loves. Can you imagine that? I used to think, in my immaturity, that that was kind of braggadocious. There's the one Jesus loves, the rest of them, yeah. <laughs> That's not what that was. What it was, was this man, this John, brother of James, son of Zebedee, cousin to Jesus through Salome, his aunt, who is the mother of Mary, or is the sister of Mary. That's who this man is that we're going to read. We're going to read what he had to say about a few missionaries. That's who he is. He was called the beloved of Christ. Well, what was so special about John? He was a fisherman. John, the only place you find that written is in the book of John. John referred to himself as the beloved of God. He wasn't bragging. What he was doing was backing up. He was backing up. Don't look at John. I'm the loved of Christ. I'm the loved of God. I, this is written by the beloved of God. This is written by the one Jesus loves. You see the difference between thinking that and thinking, oh, he's all that. He's all that. He's Bill. Is that your name? Bill. Bill. He, Bill's all that. If I said, Bill's the one Jesus loves, we need to be able to say of ourselves, I'm the one Jesus loves. I'm the one he, look at what he's done for me. Look at what he's done in me. And when that happens, mission happens. Mission is possible then. Let's look at John. I'm so excited about this guy. Was he special? Yeah. The reason he was special is because of Christ. It wasn't John. It was the beloved. It was the beloved. John 1.1. 1, 1. Look at this. In the beginning was the Word. Wait a minute. Where did we hear that phrase? In the beginning. Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. All the other Gospels are talking about Christ when he was born of his birth. Mary, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all talk about Jesus' origin. John begins with an authority greater. In the beginning, where is he going with this? He's going back to the beginning. In the beginning, this is John. Now, remember who I said John was? They call him Bonerges. He and his brother, which means sons of thunder. That's who he was called, sons of thunder. Why? I imagine because he was a nice, calm, docile guy. There was a time written about, written about in the book of Luke where the Samaritans were giving Jesus a hard time about where to stay, and he said, John said to him, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? That's Bonerges. That's sons of thunder. So that was his personality. So this man, John, this book is written by him 50 years after Jesus Christ was crucified and resurrected. So he's had 50 years, which is also later than all the other Gospels. He's had 50 years to look over the, the scene. Am I hitting this thing? Yeah. He told me to raise it. I think it's my hair. 50 years after that incident, he walked with Jesus. He was an eyewitness to all the things that we're going to read about here in a minute. You're going you're to see this man who wrote this book. Will you, will you share that with me for a minute? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, to those who don't really know what that means, that sounds pretty crazy, don't you think? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Was, was He God? Was He not God? It was with God. He wasn't God, but He was with God, and He was God. Confusing. No bad. Yeah. John, this master of um, his ability to put down what God has told him to do is saying something very clever here. He said, in the beginning was the Word, because the Jewish people understood that the Word meant God. 
the Gentile people understood that the word meant, um, it meant reason, the reason for everything. That's what it meant. So John, brilliant hand of God, written through him, he begins his teaching 50 years after this, after persecution, after all of the miracles that we read about in here, he begins to pen this and he says, let me start with the right authority, first things first. In the beginning was the Word, and it's referring to Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. There was nothing that was made without God, without the Word. Nothing that was made without the Word. So you know what? You are created. Yes. Everything that God every, created, yeah. every Muslim, every Protestant, every Czechoslovakian, every everything was created. I don't know why Czechoslovakian. Everything was created through him. Yes. Absolutely everything. Amen. It says that here. Through him all things were made. Without him, what was made? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, Nothing was made without the work. Yes. So John has just masterfully said to the people, we're talking about the Trinity here. We're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where we begin. This one begins with Mary. This one began with when Jesus came in and was baptized by John. John starts in the beginning. So when you read that and you think about this, who's speaking here? John. Who's speaking here? God. Who's speaking here? Jesus. John. Jesus. God. They're all speaking to us right here. Though through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. You are the light of the world. The darkness has not understood it. The world has amnesia. The world is blind to who they belong to. The world doesn't know their father. This is us. This is the mission. This is God's mission. God's mission. John's mission. John next. John the Baptist. It's his mission. But it's God's mission. John the Beloved says, There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all men might believe. Who's he talking about? John the Baptist, we know who John the Baptist is, right? Camel hair, locust in the desert. He said, this John, God ordained. You keep, keep track of it, okay? I know it gets confusing. God spoke to John to tell us about John, okay? God to John to John. John the Baptist now. God is telling us that this man came to bear witness of the light. What's the light? Jesus Christ. The light came into the world, but the world didn't know him. So John, God, told John to write about John. Okay, because he was there. He was there for this. It gets confusing, but it gets so powerful. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. This is a testimony of John about John the Baptist. Now do you know, John, the beloved, was with John the Baptist. He was his disciple before he was the disciple of Christ. That's why we're looking at John the Baptist. Okay? He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. What happens when you don't recognize something? You have amnesia. Who am I? Where am I? Something's wrong. You don't know who you are. You don't know where you come from. You don't know who your dad is. Let's keep looking. He came into the world that was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now, God is telling John to write to us about what John said. John the Baptist he said, yet to all who received him and believed in his name, he gave, to, he gave it to them to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. It's a mission. That's a mission that God has intended. Here's a mission. John testifies concerning him, and let's skip over that. I want to go next to chapter... Stay in chapter 1, and let's go to verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. You know why do we know this? Because John's telling us about John. <laughs> That's why we know what's going on here. The next day, John, the, the Baptist, was there again with his disciples, which is this John, 
when he saw Jesus passing by and he said, look, the Lamb of God is coming. Behold the Lamb of God. Now why John the Baptist knew this is because God told John that when, when the heavens open and the dove descends on this man, he is the Lamb of God. So that's how John the Baptist knew and that's how John the Beloved knew. Are we following? Amen. Are we following this? John the, John the Beloved is giving us meat. He's giving us something so profound, and you'll see, and I just want you to keep in mind, John the Beloved, okay? Now we're going to leave off with John. The next day after that happened, at that time, look, the Lamb of God, when the two disciples, being John, heard him say that, what, they followed him. They left John, the Baptist, John the Beloved, now follows Jesus, okay? That's why he knows all of this history, because he was there. So they went and they saw where he was staying. They spent the time with him. And the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael, and he told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about the one whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth, Nathanael said? So he, they're going along, and these men... John and the other disciple went along and said they found Philip and they found Nathaniel and they said, listen, we found the one that the scriptures have declared. And Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is Nathaniel. So now Nathaniel's on the scene. And now here's who's in the picture here. I know Tina's over here going, what? <laughs> here's the picture that we have. Here's the movie. Now we have John the Baptist. We're not looking at him right now because he had just baptized Christ. And John, that was with John the Baptist, saw that this was the Son of God, so he followed him. Okay? Now we have John the Beloved, Jesus, and now we have Philip, Andrew, and Nathaniel. Now this is all part of this party, okay? And Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. So Nathaniel goes to see. Nathaniel goes over to Jesus. Keep going. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and he said to him, behold... An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile or deceit. That was the King James word, God. Keep going. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. We've got something supernatural going on here, unless he was like right over there. <laughs> I saw you, Nathanael. No, he said, I saw you. That word is powerful. Nathanael. I saw you before you were called. I know who you are. I know what you've done. I know who you are. Keep going. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Can you imagine that revelation? I saw you. I want to talk about the next one, the wedding of Cana. When Jesus and all of his disciples were invited to go to the wedding of Cana, we have John there, we have Jesus there. And all the rest. But for now, we're just going to talk about John and Jesus, so you don't get too confused, okay? He go, they were all invited to the wedding. His mother was there, because this was her family. She comes up to Jesus, and she says, they're out of wine. This is a tragedy for a wedding. It's a tragedy now for a wedding if they're out of wine. But back then, it was a big deal. So his mother said to him, we're out, they're out of wine. And he said, what, what has that got to do with me? He said, my time is not here yet. But then he said, listen... Get the six washing pots. Now, how many of you would take your basin, your bathtub, and say, get me the stuff that we wash everybody's feet with. Get me the thing that I use to bathe the baby in. Get that for me. Get six of those. Fill them up with water. These are ceremonial washing tubs. That's what they were at the wedding. His guests would come in, and the master of the ceremony was responsible for taking care of the guests that were there for a week. They're there for a whole week, the weddings last. So they need washing. They wash their feet, they wash their hands, they threw water on their face, and now Jesus says, get me the ceremonial washing pots. Wasn't an accident that Jesus did this. He said, fill them with water. Think about why he was saying that to them. Fill them with water, and then he said, take it to the master. Take the water to the master. And of course, we know the story that the water had turned to wine because it was for the washing of our sins. The water had turned to wine, and he said, you saved the best for last. Jesus was giving them 
information about him being there in his life and his death. Let's go on a little bit further after that. Now remember, John's telling these stories. I'm going to keep reminding you. Right after the wedding that he filled up, he filled up the wedding with the wine, right? Big time party. He went into the temple, made a whip, and then he cleared out the temple. So Jesus was good at having a party, and he was good at clearing out church. That's what he did. And within a couple of days' time. Okay. Now, this guy, I like to call him Night Court Nicky. <laughs> was Nicodemus. Now, in the evening, when nobody would notice, a man named Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he said, now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, you are a teacher. We know this. It has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. And revelation back to the water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, as I told you, we were born, we were created by God in his image. So is that spirit or is that flesh? That's spirit. Our fall created flesh. We were dead. Okay? Spirit gives birth to spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. You shouldn't be surprised by this, saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Now, when I was reading that, and I was thinking, John, what are you trying to tell me here? What are you trying to give me with this passage of Scripture with Nicodemus pertaining to God's mission? Because now everything I read is, oh, that's part of the mission. That's part of God's mission, that he wants to use this circumstance of Nicodemus to educate us on what we need for the world, on, on putting through us what the world needs. Nicodemus, it says here, he said, don't, don't even worry about that. You should not be surprised by my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So it is everyone who's born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus? And he goes on to say to him, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't. I, if I tell you things about heaven... You don't even understand the things I talk about earth, he says to him. And then he goes on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life, shouldn't perish, right? So what was John, what was God telling John to tell Nicodemus to tell us? What, what was going on here? What was it? Nicodemus you come to me because you've heard about the miracles. Nobody could do those things that you did if God weren't for him, if God weren't working through him. That's what Nicodemus came to him and he said, nobody could do this without God. You must be a good teacher. You must be who you, who you are. And Jesus said to him, you must be born again. See, you can have head knowledge and you can go to every mission on the planet. You can go anywhere you want to. But unless you're born again, it doesn't make any difference where you are. It doesn't make any difference who you speak to. It's of no value if you're not born again. And how do you get born again? That's all God. That's all God. We have formulas and programs that will tell you how to get born again. But guess what? It's the wind. It goes where it wants. That's what Jesus said. Don't even worry about what I said to you. He said it's the, the Holy Spirit that does what he wants. He's the one who leads you to repentance. What's the scripture that says that? That it is the kindness of God that leads a man to repentance. It is the exposure of of God through a human or through Jesus Christ that touches your heart and says to you, you're not, you're not going to make it without me. It says to you, I died for you. That's how we get saved. That's how we get born again. When revelation happens and we are suddenly cleared of our amnesia, when we're suddenly healed of our amnesia, when the Spirit of God comes in and reveals to us it's my father. This is who this is. I'm a child of God. And guess what happens when you go from there? When you go from there and that is embedded in you, have you been through the program to be a missionary? No. Have you gotten, have you raised your money? No. What do you have? What do you have that the world needs? The Samaritan woman. That's who we're going to talk about next. Jesus was at the well. 
And he was tired from the trip that he had made and they had gone to Samaria and he sat down beside the well and a woman came over to draw water from the well. Now this is not an unusual thing. This is my water cooler ministry. There's not anything fantastical about what was going on. The woman went to the well like she did every day. Every day around supper time, she went down to pick herself up. Never mind. She went to the well to get water every day. She carried her bucket or two buckets and, and to, the, to the well. And Jesus was sitting there and he was tired. And he said, give me a drink. Let's read it because it is so powerful. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing them. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? That sounds a little harsh, huh? Why would you ask me for a drink? The Jews thought the Samaritans were dogs. They thought they were filth. They, he would never, as a Jewish rabbi, have even spoken to a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. It was, it was unheard of. But he said to her, Can you give me a drink? And she said, who are you to ask me? I imagine it was a, a weird moment, an awkward moment, because she didn't know if she was going to get killed. This is a Jew. He's talking to me. I'm a dog in the eyes of Jews. We, they don't talk, we walk across the street and bow down when a Jewish man comes past. This is who was asking this for her. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Think about this. If you knew who was here and was asking you, he would have given you living water. Now this woman, in her carnal mind, thought, living water? What do you mean by living water? Then I wouldn't have to come to this stupid well every day? I wouldn't have to carry these buckets all the time? Because she was still a human. She was still... Her mind was still human. She was still an amnesiac. She still had amnesia at this moment. And Jesus said to her, if you asked me, I would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't have anything to draw with, and this well is deep. I have a bucket. You have nothing. You have nothing to offer me. I have a, I have a bucket. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? This was on the mountain of Gerasim. And this is where that well was. And so they, she knew, the religious society says, this is how we do things. Every day, all day, we go up onto that mountain, and that's where we praise the Lord, and here's where we get our water, and this is life. And suddenly, in the middle of this very normal situation, this woman who had a need and didn't even know she had a need, she thought everything was fine in her life, didn't know she had a need, but God had a plan. God had a plan, and he told John, I want you to write this down about the Samaritan woman, and Jesus told John, this is what happened here while you guys were gone getting the food. I was over here getting the water, because I was, I was thirsty, and I was dry, and this woman showed up. <coughs> Jesus talks about this in a few minutes. She says, everyone who drinks, Jesus answered, uh, she said, our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and the flocks and his herds. And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never be thirsty. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to her, him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw this stupid water. He told her, go and get your husband and come back. I don't have a husband, she said. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. The fact is, you've had five, and the one that you're with is not your husband either. This is quite true. Now, when you think about this woman, maybe we can identify. Maybe we can identify. The reason that the story is here, that God placed it here, that he told John to write it here, that the Samaritan woman was there, is so that we could identify. It's for us. This is part of God's plan that we could see this. This woman, standing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, says, listen, I'm going to give you something that will make you never thirst again. I'm going to change you from the inside out. <coughs> thirst. Think about thirst. 
think about that. I'm hungry for this. I've got to keep going back for that water. I think about this and I think about people who believe that they are not good enough for the King of Kings, that they have sinned too much. And I think about this woman when I think about that. And I think, Lord, you are so sensitive. You are so personal, Lord, that you put her story in this so that I might see it. She left there. It says the disciples came back. The disciples came back and saw that he was talking to this woman. They, I don't even know if they knew she was married and probably, but it says he was talking to this woman and they were puzzled by that. She dropped the bucket and ran. She dropped her bucket that she was getting her water from and went back to town. And she said to the townspeople, she said, come and see. Come and see somebody who told me everything I ever did. Everything I ever did. That's what her testimony was. She didn't have sandwiches to hand out. She didn't have extra money so she could have $16 an hour. She didn't raise any funds to go anywhere. She dropped her bucket. She dropped her bucket and ran back to town and she said to the Samaritans, could this be the Christ? Come and see. He told me everything that I ever did. What a story that God told John to tell Jesus to have happen to let the Samaritan woman minister to us. What a profound moment that she saw. He, handed, he said, I'm going to give you something and it's going to flow up out of you. You want to know why missions fails? Because it's not flowing. There's nothing flowing up out of there. There's nothing. When somebody says, I can't do that. I can't speak to them. No, you can't. But if you are Christ, if you belong to him, it should flow out of you like a river. It should flow. She did not say, hey, listen, let me give you a Bible. And let me give you, let me give you the ten points of being saved. Let me tell you how to get born again. Let me tell you how to do. I'm not criticizing missions. I'm criticizing Christians. I'm not criticizing programs. They're wonderful. Have all the programs you want. Double up on them. What I'm criticizing is the message. What I'm criticizing is they left Christ at home. We left him at home. We left him here in church. He saw me. That's what she said. She said, come and see. He knew I had five husbands, and this one isn't even my husband. He knew what kind of a woman she was, and he didn't condemn her. Because Jesus Christ did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. That's what he came for. He came to fix our amnesia. He came to give us right understanding, to heal us from the inside. And what's the mission? To redeem the rest of the world. And how does that happen? It bubbles out of us. Is it my hair again? It bubbles out of us. Yep, anybody with a ponytail? I think it's this one down here. It bubbles out of us. It flows like a river. It flows out of you. Is Christ in you? I don't care what you have to say. I don't care how you have to say it. He saved me. That's all is needed. I don't have to have a 10-point message. I don't have to have a romping, stomping, anything to get you to understand. What I have to do is let you see Christ in me. I have to let you see I was at the water fountain. I was over there at the water fountain, and guess what? He offered me water that he said I would never thirst again. And then he said the most profound thing. He said, he saw that I had had five husbands. He told me everything that I ever did. They don't go into great detail in there. They just say, she said, he told me everything that I ever did. So God has ordained that we would know that everything we ever did or said, or will do, was exposed to the Lord before it happened. His water is offered anyway. He said, he didn't come to condemn her. He said, I'm going to give you some water. He said to this woman of ill repute, some called hope, he said, I'm going to give you some water. You knew I had to do it. He said, I'm going to give you something that will change you from the inside out. He's, and she ran home. She ran back to town. How many people do you think would get saved? How many people do you think would come to acknowledge Christ if what they saw in us? Oh, there's that, there's that person loved by God. How many people do you think would come to Christ if what they saw in us was, look what he did 
for me. Look what he did for me. He healed me. He knew who I was. He knew my filthy secrets. He knew the worst in me. And he healed me anyway. The kindness of God led me to that place where I said, Oh, Lord, please reside in me. Come to me. And he opened my eyes and I saw that I, was, that I belonged to him. That he was my father. And that he wrote a book for me. He wrote it from beginning to end. In the beginning. All of these things. The Samaritan woman. The next one. The official's son. The official stood before the Lord. He had gone back to Canaan. Jesus was walking. John was with him. John wrote the notes 50 years later. John was walking with him, and Jesus walked back through Cana, and an official came to him, an official, royal official came to him, and he said, Jesus, will you come to my house? My son is sick. He's near death. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, you, you, um, I don't know what he called him. He said, you have to have signs and miracles to believe. He rebuked him, the official. The official, somewhere in between there, Let's read that one because it's really, really, really good. The Word of God is living. It is powerful. This one is chapter 4, verse 43. After two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem and at the Passover feast. <laughs> Once more, he visited Cana. What happened in Cana? The party. party. The party. The party and all the vats of bath water. Bath water wine. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum, which is about 15 miles away from him. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived from Galilee and Judea, he went to him and he begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Here's the rebuke. Unless you people see miracles, signs, and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. Picture this one, huh? This man is desperate. What he knows of Jesus, the story about Jesus is he did some miracles. He made, he made wine out of water. That's what he knows about him. And he, he's back in Cana. So this man beats time to get there and say to him, will you come to my house? So something was stirring already in him when he got there. Jesus, will you come to my house? My son is sick. And Jesus said to him, a rebuke. You people will only believe when you see signs and miracles. And it says right after that, the royal official said, Jesus replied, you may go. Oh, the yeah, the royal official said, sir, come down before he dies. So that's the second time he said it. He's very desperate, right? Jesus, you may go. Your son will live. And this part I love. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. John's writing this for a purpose, for a profound purpose. Fifty years after Jesus had died, this happened. This man had a sick child and Jesus stood there and Jesus said to him, you have to see signs and miracles for this. At that moment, what is not written is this. Suddenly, the royal official went, Oh, it's you! It's you! That's what the royal official suddenly did. He saw him. His eyes were open. He went home. He took him at his word, it says. What a, what a nice, powerful way to put that. He took him at his word. You can't take somebody at his word if you don't believe him. You can't believe somebody if you don't believe in somebody. You can't believe any of it unless you believe it. And belief is what comes from God. His eyes were open, and it says he went home. And the servant met him and said to him, Your son is well. Your son is well. And he said, well, When was that? Just out of curiosity. When did that happen? Yesterday, about this hour. And the royal official said, Bingo. Bingo. It was him. I knew it was him. I knew it was him. He saved him. When you go in this mission, how many missionaries do we have in the room? No more missionaries? Yes. You tell me, I don't know what to say. I don't know what you've said to me. I have to talk to these people about the Lord. I have to get them saved, but I don't know what to say. Don't worry about what to say. 
You are the mission. You aren't on a mission. You are the mission. You are God's mission. We belong to God, and we are part of his story. So, John, this beloved, this is about us. The beloved is us. We are the beloved. When people look at you, they shouldn't see Tommy, the electrician. They should see, that's the guy that loves Jesus. That's the guy that, that they shouldn't see Jeff, the guitar player. That's the guy that is so crazy about Jesus that you ask him anything, and that's what flows out of him. Amen. You tell him you're sick, and what flows out of him is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be healed. Amen. Because the Spirit of God leads you to this. This is what happens. By the power of the Holy Ghost, be made well. What, where's the power of the Holy Ghost? Right in here. He's in here. We have him. We carry him to the world. We are the light of the world. Amen? Amen. So we have a need. What is too hard for our God? Amen. What is too hard for our God? Hallelujah. You're walking, talking missions. You are a walking, talking yes. missionary. And everything that flows out of you is a river of living Amen. water. That spirit of God that lives within you. Hallelujah. Now, so we have amnesia. We did. We had amnesia. And we deal with a world that is so tragic. A world that is so lost and so broken. But we are the mission. Amen. We have been changed from death to life, John said. John said we've been taken from death to life. This John that I'm talking about that wrote this that God told him to write it. Not the Baptist. Yes, not the Baptist. John, John the Beloved. When you reread John, the book of John, I want you to read it with your eyes open to who's talking to you and what's he saying. Fifty years after this, the church had gone through persecution. He died on the Isle of Patmos in his 90s, give or take, 80s, 90s. He witnessed all of these things and he watched what happened in the world. And he wanted to give this to us. God wanted us to have this. He wanted us to have the book of John. And I'm, I'm thrilled because it was mission-minded. Everything in this book is the mission. Every portion in this book is the mission. But it didn't end in Revelation. This is the mission. We are on a mission. You don't have to go pack your bags. If God tells you to go pack your bags, do that. If you end up going back to Africa, sorry, Bill, that's hot over there. If God tells you to do it, do it. But if God tells you to go buy a gallon of milk and you're standing next to somebody who has a teenager who's standing there looking extremely weathered and, and sad, maybe the Spirit of God will lead you to say to them, listen, I want to tell you something, young man, young woman, 13 years old, desperate. I want to tell you something. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that God knows who you are and he's got a plan. Don't you forget that. I don't care about the piercings. I don't care about the long hair. I don't care about the blue hair. I don't care about any of that. What I want you to know is that God created you and he has a plan and you're part of the mission. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep going. Oh, That's yeah. what he wants to, he, us to do. He wants us to be led moment by moment. And you are a missionary every day, all day, yeah. always. Every day, all day, always. That's what I want you to say to me with me right now. Every day, all day, always. I belong to the Lord and He works through me. I'm the beloved of God. You're the beloved of God. He has a plan. He has a plan and we are in it. We are part of it. And I want to ask you something. John was used by God to minister to us. And we're used by God to minister to each other. If you have a need to, you are filled with you are in a house that is filled with the love of God. You are in a house today that is not ashamed of the gospel, that is not ashamed of Jesus Christ. You are in a house today that knows the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to tell me if you need prayer. I want you to ask for that prayer. I want you to know that we are the body of Christ collectively. And we minister to each other. We pick each other up, we raise each other up, we remind each other, listen, listen sister, I don't care what that said, I don't care what that report said, I don't care what that boss said, I don't care what that looks like, you are the, the beloved of God, and he has a plan for you, don't give up, don't give up Bernard, don't give up, I don't care what it looks like, I don't care how sad it gets, don't give up, you are part of the answer, you are part of the answer yes. Bernard, you're Amen. part of the answer right where you live, Hallelujah. part of the, his answer to redeem his people, yes. to fill this world with God's love, because God's love is in you, and it says if you don't have love for your brothers, you don't love God, right. you don't know God, if you don't have the love of God within you, <laughs> done, done, Father God, if you would, if any of you would like prayer, I would love to invite you to come up. 
I'd love to invite my husband to come up. And I think we have some anointing oil here. Yes. But I want you to recognize what made that woman whole. Your Heine's tired, honey. What made that woman whole was her understanding when the blinders were removed. That's what made you whole. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, God took a moment out of his creation and he enlightened your heart that he loved you. And you were suddenly stunned by the realization that I belong to him. He doesn't care what I did. He doesn't hold it against me. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn me. He loves me. Yeah. To know that God knows what you did yesterday and still loves you. That God knows what you did six months ago and tomorrow and still loves you. We're so preoccupied with sin that we don't see the love. We're so preoccupied with our sins and our failures and our plans and our programs that we don't see the love of God. That's what the world needs. That's what missions needs. Missions needs what how many ever are here to walk out this door now not feeling condemned, not feeling incapable, but to walk out this door with the love of God exploding out of you. You don't have anything you have to do but be. You just have to be his child. That's it. Wherever you are, whatever you do, every day, always, all the time. Every day, always, all the time. Amen? Amen. Now, listen, you have a health issue, and you would like your family to come around you and just pray for you.